Continuing our investigation into the warrior archetype, I want to talk today as a writer rather than as a historian. You know, one of the things that I get asked a lot about my book, Gates of Fire, is how did you get the idea? What was it made you want to write about the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae? And uh, just as a sidebar on this, the movie 300 does not come from Gates of Fire. It comes from Frank Miller's graphic novel of that same title. So Gates of Fire is an entirely different story, or the same historical story, but told in a whole different way. So anyway, but where did I get the idea of this? I was reading Herodotus, the histories, just for fun, and I came to the part about the Battle of Thermopylae. And there's a story about the Spartan Dionychus, a true life historical figure, and when he was told by someone who had seen the Persian army advancing against them, that they were so many of them that when their archers fired a volley, the mass of the arrows blocked out the sun. And Dionychus responded, good, then we'll have our battle in the shade. And when I heard that thing, that quote, I said, I gotta do something with this. This is just too good to, uh, to leave alone. But let's talk for a minute about the odds in this battle, which is another thing that really got to me. Now, the Greeks, you have to remember, at this stage, were a poor nation. They were a backwater. When the Persian king Xerxes, or Darius, his father, first heard of the Greeks, he didn't even know who they were. They were so far on the periphery of his empire. So the, the entire Spartan army, Spartan citizen army, when it put into the field, was only 9,000 men. And there was at no point in this time had any Greek force ever put more than 50,000 on both sides into the field. Meanwhile, here come the Persians from the other side of the world with two million men. So the odds were just ridiculous. Now, let's talk for a second about the historical reality of that. I mean, could that really be true? Could two million men actually, how would you feed them? How would you house them? How would they get across these? Well, let's think about the size of the Persian Empire. I'm going to try to rattle off some of the, some of the names of the countries, and I'm going to forget a lot of them, but Parthia, Drangia, Sogdiana, all of Afghanistan, all the Afghan kingdoms, what today is Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Egypt, Persia, Medea, Babylonia, Armenia, Cappadocia, Paphlagonia, Lycia, all of Thrace. In other words, basically the entire world from India and Pakistan today to the, to the Mediterranean at the time. How much money did they have? Later, a couple of hundred years later, when Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire and loaded up their gold, it was 13,000 pairs of, of mules to carry the gold. And this was only half of it. So this was a, just a gigantic empire coming against the, the Greeks who had never put more than 40, 50,000 men in the field at one time. But the stories that are told in Herodotus was that the Persian king, Xerxes, would send envoys ahead of the army, and they would go to various cities and demand their surrenders. And of course, the cities immediately surrendered. But they also demanded that they feed the army. And even for one day, supposedly, it would bankrupt any city. The Persian forces would drink rivers dry, according to Herodotus. So why am I dwelling on this vast scale of the Persian Empire as opposed to the poverty-stricken aspect of the Greeks. It's just for the outsized odds, the overwhelming odds that they were facing. But let's get back to Dionychus at the pass. Let's set this into, set the story into perspective. The Greeks have left southern Greece and marched north to this narrow pass of Thermopylae, and they get there before the Persians have arrived. Now remember, they have never seen in the Persians, they've never fought the Persians, they have no concept of what, except that it's a huge number coming their way. So they take possession of the pass, they set up their defenses, such as they may be, and they're just kind of waiting and waiting for the enemy to show. And suddenly, a native of the area, a fellow Greek, comes running in with his hair on fire, hysterical, and he has, like, seen the Persian for the first time. He's the first one who's seen him. And he tells the, the Spartans and their allies, get out of here now, you guys don't have a chance. What are you, crazy? Get out of here. Save your lives. And to try to impress upon the Spartans, how, how vast the army is, he uses that analogy that when the Persian archers fire their volleys, the mass of arrows is so great that it blocks out the sun. And that's when Dionica says his quip, good, then we'll have our battle in the shade. And for me, as a writer, 
when I heard that, I could just absolutely relate to that guy. In my own experience in the service, I've known guys like that, and I just thought, this is a hero. This is somebody that we can really get into. From a writer's point of view, it's like red meat. I just really wanted to write about Dionicus. And so that was the impetus for Gates of Fire, that one quote from Herodotus. Now, just to add one other kind of crazy personal aspect to this story, when I was a kid, from the time I was 11 years old all the way through college, the way I would earn money in the summers was caddying. I used to carry golf bags for golfers. And it taught me a, a number of things about the concept of what would seem to be a servant, but in reality becomes kind of an ally of the, uh, of the player that you're, that you're working for. And I immediately thought, you know, in the, in the ancient world, Spartans or Romans or any of these other forces couldn't carry their own armor. They had servants that would carry the armor for them. The armor was too heavy, you know, to carry all their stuff. They had to have, you know, what would be like the equivalent of a squire in the Middle Ages. And so I thought, when I was thinking, how am I going to tell this story about Dionicus for Gates of Fire? I thought, he would have to have a squire. He would have to have somebody that carried his heavy stuff for him. And this person was probably a young, a young boy, you know. And I just thought, I can relate to that. I can, I can understand. And the other great thing about that is that sort of character becomes a fly on the wall. He can kind of go anywhere in the story and report back to us, the readers, and we'll accept it. Oh, he was there with Leonidas. He was there, you know, uh, in the morning, in the evening, whenever. So in any, in any event, that's kind of a little personal side note of what let me into this story. I thought I can tell it through the eyes of the young man that's carrying this hero, Dionicus' armor. And that was sort of, that really put, put the book over for me in my head. I thought, I can do this. I can write it that way. Mm -hmm.